intro. Okay, so we have the Zoom legalities out of the way and welcome everybody to the Queen's Chamber of Commerce Tech Committee webinar, The Changing Landscape of Cyber Threats. My name is Sean O'Rourke and I am going to be your moderator today. Um, and we have some uh, experts in the field of cyber threats. And if you've been following the promotion of this event, you know they are the co-hosts of the podcast Security Squawk. And if you've given them a listen, you know this is going to be a very entertaining 45 minutes to an hour conversation. And it might veer off of cyber threats into anything if you've uh, listened to the podcast. So uh, my job is to make sure that the cats stay corralled. But it's also to monitor the chat window. If you are joining us live, I want to thank you for doing so. And you are welcome to participate in this webinar. Feel free to submit your questions via the chat, of which I will be monitoring. I have my own questions right here, just in case. Uh, but for the most part, we want to make sure that we're going to answer uh, the questions that you might have at the top of your mind as it relates to threats to your business of the cyber variety. And again, as I said, my name is Sean O'Rourke. I am a cyber liability consultant for Combs & Company, which is a insurance brokerage firm headquartered in New York City. And now let's meet the esteemed guests who are going to take you on a, uh, a joy ride for the next hour. And Randy, we're going to start with you. Tell the fine folks who you are and what you do. Hey everybody, I'm Randy Bryan. I'm from San Marcos, Texas, father of four, love the outdoors and all that kind of stuff. And I also am a technical geek, cybersecurity expert. Um, I've, uh, I'm an author and like you mentioned, um, love being a part of that podcast. I'm also the CEO and founder of Tech Rescue. And at Tech Rescue, we help rescue people from cybersecurity threats. Attacks are way up. We help to mitigate that risk. And basically, like we talked about earlier in the green room, we basically prepare people for the attacks that are coming. So once again, I'm excited to be here. Randy Bryan from San Marcos, Texas. Thank you very much, sir. And four kids, congratulations on still being as right. youthful as you are. If you hear screaming okay. in the background, you'll know what it is. Yes, we, we, we said it in advance. Pets and children are allowed on this webinar. Okay, Brian, you're up. Hey, everyone. Uh, Brian Horning here. Uh, thank you for having all of us on. And uh, I do, and like Randy, share a love for the outdoors. I also am freakishly in love with the game of ice hockey. Hey, Brian, I think your mic is fading in and out. So. Apologize about that. Get closer. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Try it again. All right. So. Brian Horning, uh, like Randy, I share a similar uh, love for the outdoors, and uh, I am the CEO of Exact IT Solutions. I'm also the author of three cybersecurity books, one just released in the last couple of weeks called Checkmate, um, and I'm happy to be here and share what I know about cybersecurity with you today. Fantastic. Thank you very much. And so people don't get confused. His name is Reginald Andre, but he goes by Andre. So Andre, close this introductory portion out. Absolutely. Yeah. So I'm French. So um, I have two first names. So I get to choose. So I go by my last name. The only person that calls me Reginald is my mom. But it's OK if you call me Reginald as well. Um, I am in the beautiful city of Miami Gardens, Florida, which is about 10 minutes away from South Beach. And we have a cybersecurity company. We're a team of 11 people. And uh, we have, I have two children and uh, love playing basketball. Fantastic. OK, so as you can see, we have a very diverse geographic group. We have a very, though, cohesive group of cybersecurity experts. And again, if you have questions, once we get started, be sure to put them in the chat box. But I get to go first. So. Cyber threats are basically part of everyday life if you own a business, if you work in a business. And the very first question that I want to highlight is a question that a lot of people who don't work or live in IT tend to ask. And what are the threats that are currently out there that have your attention or keep you awake at night? And uh, Andre, we're going to start with you, because I think this is the crux in terms of trying to educate people who are not in this on a day-to-day -day basis 
on what exactly is going on out there. Yeah, so the biggest thing I see, the biggest problem I, I see in our world is us, everyone listening, the business owners, <laughs> the lack of education that there is on how you should be maintaining your systems, how you should be patching your systems. These cyber attackers, they're, they're, yes, they're, they're sophisticated, they know what they're doing, but a lot of times that they can be stopped if we were just doing the basic things to keep our system secure. So I'm gonna go with, you know, it's, it's about education. And if us business owners and, and, you know, users are not educated as far as what they should be doing and what type of training they should have, then, then all of this is just gonna be easy for them to do what they're doing now. Okay, that's a good, and we'll, we'll come back to employee training um, uh, later on in the conversation. But Brian, you get to uh, you get to chime in with your thoughts on this one. Thanks, Sean. Um, so can you hear me? Okay, I switched over to your yep. Yep, you're okay. great. All right, good. Uh, so uh, I'm going to skip over the rant of my part right now and just go into what is actually the biggest threat to businesses right now. It is the number one attack vector for all businesses across the board, from small to enterprise, and that's business email compromise. Um, securing the email, the information, a lot of people just think, I don't have a lot in my email, but what we find when we evaluate companies and see where their data is and see where the important data is, a lot of it lives in your email, whether you think it does or not. Um, email is very hard to control what you receive. So just, you might receive something that has sensitive information from somebody. It's not that you put it there. And a lot of people don't think of it that way. Uh, but business email compromise is the number one attack vector. It is the number one way that businesses lose money and fall victim to a cyber attack. So I would say make sure you're doing everything you can to secure your email accounts. So and and let's sort of clarify that business email compromise. It, can you just explain what it means, maybe just from a practical standpoint? Sure. It's simply that a person who is not supposed to have access to your email gains access. So what right. we typically see is cyber criminals are using stolen credentials that are out freely traded either on the surface web or the dark web. And they're using those credentials and using the information that they've collected on your company. And they're either targeting you directly or they're just uh, you know, spraying and praying that they're able to crack into an account. Right. So it could be Gmail, it could be Office 365, it could be whatever email platform you're using and they're getting into these systems and then they're harvesting that information and using it against businesses. Yep, and I, I'll be honest with you, business email compromise and SIM attacks are the two that make me nervous just about my own infrastructure, personal and business-wise because the damage that can be done if you get access to either one of those is just almost incalculable to a certain extent. Okay, Great point. Randy, you're gonna finish this up. Uh, what's on your mind? So um, the three that keep me awake at night. So first on my list was phishing, um, going along exactly with what uh, Brian already mentioned. And it also ties in with what Andre mentioned um, because phishing, um, is typically how they get in. We have seen a lot of credential attacks, especially um, since the Ukraine um, invasion where people are trying to get into, you know, the 365 accounts and things like that to get access to the email, but they can also send a phishing email and get in that way. Um, with training and with the proper setup in 365, you can mitigate a lot of that, but most companies are just sitting ducks. Um, the other one I put is credentials attack. I think uh, Brian uh, mentioned that one also. There, there's literally hundreds of millions, if not billions of credentials that are available right now on the dark web, both for free and for sale. And so they just take those and start trying to sign in with them. And the average credential attack um, on a business averages around uh, almost 400K is the cost to a business. And then the third one, um, I mentioned this on our podcast uh, on Monday. We did it on Monday this week. It's the most unsexy of all the of all the attacks, and, and it is patching um, because there are so many vulnerabilities that have been fixed, and there's so many companies out there. They're not doing any kind of patching, or maybe they're just doing Windows patching, 
and not mm -hmm. doing Chrome patching. Literally right now, there's a, a, a Chrome update that's available and it is a vulnerability that affects 3.2 billion users. And right. it, it was put out like, I guess like four or five days ago. Um, and it's something that needs to, uh, needs to be done. So uh, patching is also a really big one. And, you know, patching has been around for like 10 years. That's why it's like the unsexiest of all the, mm -hmm. of all the issues, but it's still important. Like, and it gets overlooked because we all assume, you know, Hey, patching and backups, everybody's doing that. Right. Uh, but the reality is, even though people know, it doesn't mean they're going to do. So those are my, well, thoughts. and, and they're not magic. You actually have to work at them to a certain extent, even if they're automated they you still have to to work at them. I want to take a very quick detour with you, Randy, since you brought it up, the credentialing. Um, and all of you just sort of summarized one of the reasons why I got out of the industry about six years ago, because all of this just continues to exist uh, and will never go away. But credentialing, that brings up passwords. And uh, we'll do another round robin on this. We're already on a tangent uh, because I've thought about this. Passwords. One of the reasons why credentialing has a tendency to work is because people reuse passwords. So from that perspective, what do you do? How do you get people not to reuse passwords? Um, you've got to get their passwords into some sort of password software that will, that will check the passwords against known leaks and then notify the user. We, we did a cybersecurity review for a business and we're sitting in with them. Um, this was probably six months ago, four months ago, and going through the different vulnerabilities we found and we got to the password section. And the guy, I'm colorblind, so I've heard this from the salesperson that was in there with me, but he basically got, he got visibly upset, um, turned ghost white because he saw his password for his Fitbit, okay? And he realized when he saw that, that's his password that he uses for everything. That email, yeah. that password, plain text leaked on the dark web. And that is when he realized that that point was his, his risk. Um, that's when we call it, that's when he ate the risk sandwich. Um, he realized <laughs> that the risk was out there. We'd been eating the risk sandwich. Um, now he's eating the risk sandwich and he understands that he needs to do something about it. But getting them into a, a password keeper, like Keeper, LastPass, there's, there's several really good ones out there that will then take the passwords because you don't want to, you know, you don't want to save them into your browser. The browsers will do a check now also, both Chrome and Edge. But then if your account with them gets compromised, they also get your passwords. So we recommend to people keep keeping them in a separate keeper, um, if you will. Um, and then they can be notified and then they can go in and change them as they're, uh, as they're notified of them. Sure. So that's the best thing to do, I think. Okay. Brian, actually, I want to move on to the next question because you mentioned this before and it actually dovetails perfectly with the next question. When I was in your shoes, I heard a lot, we're too small. We don't have anything anybody would want when it comes to data and what have you. But why are those no longer legitimate arguments uh, when yeah. it comes to, to doing the right thing by cybersecurity? Yeah, another great question. Thanks for asking it. It's, uh, you know, for the businesses out there <laughs> that have the mindset that uh, this is something that is not going to hit your business, you're too small for it, we don't have important data. If you have employees, you have important data, right? Mm -hmm. we're, seeing, uh, we're seeing police departments be attacked. And, you know, yeah, police departments, they have criminal records and things like that. But when cyber criminals attack municipalities and police departments, they're going after the employee information. Why is that valuable? It's social security numbers. It's salary information. It's uh, home address information. It's all the things I can use to basically steal your identity or apply for credit or, you know, other things that you can do with all that information. Uh, it can also be used in individual extortion attempts against your employees. You know, if you're able to find medical records or maybe find uh, something that they're being treated for that they might not want out there. Right. These are all real situations that occur in today's day and age when these cyber criminals 
get their hands on this information. So, you know, you might not, you might own a restaurant and you might, you know, deal with credit card, th- credit card numbers, and you might dish that off to a third party processor where that's not your responsibility to secure that. But you probably have an HR file somewhere that has valuable information. Um, and that's how where I think most businesses get it wrong. They don't do a full analysis of their critical data and they kind of forget that they have all this, you know, really good data that, you know, is in their HR file. So. Yeah. And first of all, your sigh before you answered the question just sounds so familiar because that's what I used to do all the time when I heard that argument. It's just, uh, OK, I got to do this again. Um, but to that end, real quick, as it relates to sort of the business email compromise, you mentioned this before, you don't have to be the target. There's so much out there that just get it, that you 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 spray and pray to a certain extent. Mm-hmm. You could get hit by accident. Yeah. The biggest thing that people need to understand about hacking and cyber attacks is I've always said this. I've said I actually said this before I was involved in cybersecurity and I was a software developer and we were trying to get people to use software. It's 85% psychology and 15% technology. of cybersecurity is me getting you to do something so I can get my malware and my bad stuff on your system. So if I can use somebody's level of trust, meaning, Sean, you have a level of trust with your your clients. Uh, If somebody were to receive an email from you, they probably would be like, oh, what's Sean sending me here? He's asking me to click on something. And if if I'm able to overtake your email account and send it to your entire contact list that's in Outlook, I might get lucky. I might get two or three people to click on that. And that's all mm-hmm. I really need. Um, and I'm using your good name, your trust, your reputation to achieve my criminal goals. Uh, and that's the name of the game, whether you see it on social media. That's why you see tons of people saying, don't, don't click on anything I sent you. My Facebook got hacked. My Instagram got hacked. It's the same idea. These cyber criminals are using the trust that's built with their community, with their audience, with their friends and family to further their attacks. Uh, And that's just, I mean, that's why it's one of those worrying things for me, just on a personal level, because, I mean, you know what it can do. It could destroy your life if somebody gains access uh, to your email, because everything is done through there to a certain extent. Great, great comment. And the stakes are higher if you're in a business, in my opinion. I mean, because you have yeah. so much more to lose. Yep. Exactly. So, uh, Andre, before we hit the record button, uh, you were being quoted by Randy uh, from a line that I, th- I guess you said, I think you said on one of the podcasts is that 2022 will be the year if you don't have MFA, you will be hacked. Yeah. But I think it speaks to your point uh, that you initially said that. Uh, Businesses have to do the right things. And so when you go into a business and you're looking at it, what are some of the top right things that you make sure they're doing or you have to implement for those businesses? Yeah, so going back again to the patching, what software are they using? Is this is the software, for example, not Windows 7? Are you running the latest operating system? Um, the software that you're using within the operating system are you still getting support? A lot of times we see these companies, especially like in manufacturing, where they have these legacy systems and over the time, the owner just never upgraded. And now Mm -hmm. they they find themselves five years later with a system that doesn't have support. Uh, You call the manufacturer, they're not gonna help. And now there's some type of vulnerability with that software and it's connected to the internet. And again, this is what the hackers are doing. All they're looking for is known vulnerabilities and to get into your system. And that's the easiest, one of the easiest ways for them to get in. So um, that's usually the first thing that we want to do is make sure that everything that they're using um, has support and has the latest updates. And um, just really going right right back to, you know, we're too small because we get that a lot, especially, you know, we're talking to the chamber. I know you have some coffee shops and small, smaller businesses that may only have the five employees. But one of the one of the things that's important is when you're listening on the news and you hear the government, you know, if they had an incident or a big business, Fortune 500 company, they they're regulated. They have to tell the public about this. But there's so many small businesses that are getting that are getting hacked 
that they're not reporting into the insurance company. They're not, they, they're embarrassed. They don't want to tell anybody. They're sweeping them under the rug, buying new computers and just trying to deal with it. So that's one of the misconceptions is we're too small and, and then follow up by, well, I never hear any of my friends. Nobody ever told me that they got hacked. So wh why would they come after me? Right. Uh, and I think that to your point is one of the the biggest misconceptions is that they think it only happens to the big guys where really the real damage and the more numerous incidents are on the small mid-sized level. But to your point, they have a tendency not to say anything, which from a legal perspective is terrible because if anybody ever finds out, I mean, that just exacerbates the damage even more so. But I think from that perspective, doing the right thing has to be dictated by more than just the maybe the regulatory deal. There has to be a moral obligation to say, hey, my client's data might have been compromised. Maybe I should let them know. But Andre, to continue on your point, can you explain to people who might not know, hopefully everybody on this webinar knows, but maybe they're watching this uh, after the, uh, the recording of this, what is MFA and why has it become so important for businesses? Sure. So the whole idea with MFA is that if your your password was compromised, think of your email password. If someone was able to get your email password and they go into the portal and log in, what MFA is, is a two-factor authentication is you have an app on your phone. And when you put in your password, it acts for that six-digit code or whatever you know code that expires every 30 seconds and rotates. So yes, the hackers have your password, but they don't have your phone. And that stops them dead in the track and, and getting in. And from my perspective, believe it or not, from a cyber insurance deal, that's not negotiable now. That has to be on everything, not just on maybe a cloud service or on your domain or what have you. It has to be on everything. If it's not on everything, you can't even get considered for cyber insurance at the moment. Um, so the game has really changed the last two years in my field uh, in terms of the evolving technologies and insurance carriers becoming aware of those on how to better secure uh, certain things. So now I want to go to another round robin question. And this, I want you to put on sort of your, your futurist hats. Where do you see cyber threats either new ones or old ones coming back, um, evolving. And again, in, in technology, you can't look out more than maybe a year, maybe two with any kind of reasonableness. So let's keep it to one or two years. Where do you see the threats evolving? And Randy, let's start with you. Yeah, the, this is great because, you know, we were just talking about why I'm too small or, you know, I might be too small to, for a hacker to go after me. We hear that all the time. And it's a super passionate thing for me because like these, like these men already said, there's, a, there's great value in your business and you can't even begin to describe it. And one of the areas where we're seeing cybercrime go is, is towards the small. Um, they, they have, and this is to answer your question, they, they have um, developed what they call ransomware as a service. And what that means is if it has as a service, that means that it's basically it's handled by someone else. Um, typically, it's a cloud based service. You know, so you have you know, like generically you have software as a service, also called SaaS or SaaS, depending on, you know, if you're American or Canadian <laughs> right, right. or Texan or whatever, wherever um, you might be from. Yes. Um, which, you know, you'd like your 365 as a software as a service. Um, you're you know, you have backups that are software as a service. Well, the, the criminals have rolled out this, this service called ransomware as a service, R-A-A-S, ransomware as a service. And basically, they have, they've developed full-blown companies. They've got employee of the month. They've got performance goals. They've got all this stuff. And what they basically are, are doing is saying, hey, you small-time criminal, you know, you don't really know how to code. You know, you can break in a window with a hammer, you know, and you can get on somebody's computer. You put the, the, the ransomware as a service on that computer and we'll handle the rest. They even now, the, the big group, um, Conti, I believe, is now what they're doing 
is they're even offering as part of their ransomware as a service, they're even offering negotiation services. So basically, mm -hmm. you just get the ransomware on the computer and they're handling everything, um, you know, white glove, if, if you will. So to me, that is up and coming is a really, really big, um, big thing we need to watch out for because, you know, people have been saying I'm too small. It's fixing to be a tsunami. As they right. learn how to scale, it's going to be a, a tsunami. And very much related to that, another threat that I see um, coming in the next year or two is employee bribery of the good guys. So the bad guys are going to be bribing employees on the good guys side to install the ransomware as a service, to let them into the network. We've are already seen where they're offering tons of money. It's insane to be mm -hmm. able to get into people's networks. And, you know, I don't see on those requests, I don't see where they're offering, you know, hey, 200K, they're not saying must be bigger than 50 workstations. Why? Because you guys already mentioned it. There, there is so much value in even a two or three person company with their relationships, their personal Facebooks, like all of that. There's so much value. If they can get into that company, they can leverage that for so much. So that's, that's another really big uh, thing for me I see coming over the, uh, the next uh, two years. And then really quick, um, with all of the COVID-19, we're seeing still lots of COVID-19. I call it COVID-19 fatigue. Um, you know, you got the great resignation. And I think we're going to see more employees that are on the, you know, they're like, man, I'm just tired of this. We've already seen uh, stats come out where employees will just click on something. They know it's bad. They just want to see what will happen. I mean, because they're just they're just wore out from all this, you know, Zoom calls all the time and not being around people and having to do this and having to do that. So I think as we work out of this, um, that that's that's a, an issue right now that we're going to see more of over the next uh, year or two. OK, before I move on to, for Brian's answer, I want to put a caveat out there. This webinar is not to in, to induce panic. You are not supposed to become paranoid. You're supposed to become uh, practical and more aware of what's out there. But as Randy just panicking. said, there's there's a lot of stuff going on out there. So, uh, Brian, let's let's just keep piling on people. So your turn. Yeah, I'll try to break it down for you like this. Um, <clears throat> So about five years ago, uh, the, the kind of the flavor of the month for cybersecurity when it relate, as it relates to cyber insurance and kind of like the requirements that they were putting on businesses at the time um, evolved from, if you remember, a lot of people use that program like AVG Free. Mm -hmm. um, that's what we, we, we know is known as signature-based antivirus. It's the old school right. antivirus. So like, it's kind of like it had a database and if the file matched that it's something in their database then that file was flagged. And then we moved on to something called endpoint protection, which was a little bit more advanced. It wasn't using signatures anymore. And it was able to detect things on a system at, at a different level that didn't require things to be known, right? It can detect right. things that maybe weren't known because Quite frankly, hackers evolved their tactics. They were like, okay, we're not going to put, you know, malware that these antivirus programs know about. We're going to change up, you know, certain things within the program so it can't detect that, right? So we needed to move towards endpoint protection. So insurance companies started asking, what endpoint protection are you using or are you using it? Now, fast forward to today, to 2022, as Andre said, it's MFA. That's what's on your cyber insurance application. That's what they want you to do right now. What are they going to want you to do in two years? They're going to want you to do zero trust. That's what's going yeah. to get you cyber insurance is you have to be doing some form of zero trust on either your network or on your computer. So um, can, MFA, you explain, can you explain zero trust? Because that, that's, a, that's a, a term I guarantee the majority of people watching this probably have not heard. Yeah. Zero trust is essentially, if you just think about it from a non-technical standpoint, just think about it as like a bouncer at a nightclub door. They're not letting anybody in unless they know who you are and, and you're on the list, right? And that's mm -hmm. basically what we do. We don't let computers on the network unless we know about them. There's certain things that we can input in, in the settings to allow that computer to talk on the network. 
But if you just walk into an office and you can plug your laptop in and get internet access or get on the network, you're not implementing zero trust. Mm -hmm. Zero trust makes it difficult for somebody just to plug in and get connected. Uh, same thing with computers and software. We can zero trust what software gets installed, right? You, you, can, you can allow certain things to run on systems using zero trust technology. So essentially it's you trust nothing and you treat everything as a bad actor until you evaluate it and you know it's not. Um, that's the simplest way to break it down. Uh, but that's where the world's going. They are going to absolutely, the insurance companies are absolutely going to say to businesses within the next couple of years and simply because right now MFA is, is enough. But every day there's hackers waking up looking to circumvent MFA. Oh, sure. um, and, and that's what their goal is right now. How can we devise technology that can get around this MFA technology that's been put in place, that's been hindering us a little bit? And going based off history, MFA is not going to be a silver bullet that's going to stop things for very long. They're going to figure out how to circumvent that. They're going to get around it different ways. And that's where I believe zero trust is going to come into play in the next couple of years. Well, to your point, this is the 21st century arms race. Um, this is we're not building nuclear weapons. We're building cyber weapons and cyber defenses. So it's just okay, we've got MFA, they'll beat MFA, then we go to zero trust, and then there'll have to be something after that. So, um, and we did get a question on zero trust that I will get to after Andre, you give me how you see the next one to two years uh, for yourself. So with all everything we've just said, I think, unfortunately, the consumer, the business owner, they're going to get numb to it when it comes to the data breaches. Um, you know, it seems like once every, every, every day, really, it happens where you're getting something either in the mail or you're seeing a news article, some bank was hacked and, oh, and by the way, you know, employees, social security number, address, email, medical records. And like, we're seeing that so much and it's so nonchalant. It's like, yep, sorry, um, we didn't take care of our systems and, you know, your data got hacked and now it's out in the dark web being sold. And, and there's there's like, that's it, you know? And there's no re repercussions to those companies that does that. So I unfortunately see in the next two years, it's just gonna be like, yep, my data got hacked. I know my data's out there and 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 that's it. So be it. Yeah. Okay, which so- bad, Which is bad, <laughs> which, yeah. which, is hor you know, which is horrible. Um, so, right, it doesn't matter how, how many times it's been hacked. It's bad every time there is a is a hack. So what's your plan to sort of counteract that that weariness uh, about hearing about the data breaches and, and hearing another episode about cybersecurity and what they should be doing. Yeah, so when we're going into, uh, especially with our new clients, we are trying to make it a culture. That's like our biggest thing because um, here in South Florida, we have hurricanes and you don't get, you don't just like the day before decide, you know what, my window, uh, let me see if I can go get some shutters or let me see if I can get some plywood. We have shutters in the in the in the garage. We have you know 20 gallons of water just just sits there all year, and we we plan for this. And we know that um, just like if you have a fire drill in your building, in your office building, there's your, or schools, they have fire drills and those type of drills. It's the same thing with us. So we are trying to make the culture ingrained where when our um, customers are having their monthly team meetings you know, there's three or four minutes for, for the IT guy just to tell him about the latest threat that's happening. Hey, look, if you ever call, we will never call you for support. Or if we do call you from support, we're not going to have you go to log me in or team viewer or some other way to get access to your system. You know, this is our team. This is our faces. You know, our people, if you all of a sudden get a new guy, question it. So we're trying to ingrain that into the culture of the business so that they can be prepared and, um, and, and you know, be ready for, for the inevitable. So um, Brian, you get to answer this question that was submitted from um, somebody who's in attendance. And I know this person, so I know he's got a technical background, which is why he asked this. Uh, but his question is, what are the obstacles to implementing zero trust so it is adopted sooner? Uh, there's there's a there are many, but if one, two, or three that you think are are top of what's going to make it difficult to implement zero trust 
So uh, how we had to do zero trust five years ago versus how we do it today has has is much better today. It's much easier. The technology is is growing, and there's a lot of R and D being pushed into zero trust technologies. So we have more tools to work with today than we did say five years ago. So it is getting easier and I expect that trend to continue. The biggest obstacle I have practically implementing this in businesses is that, and it kind of goes to the next question that I see from Jesse with that mm -hmm. packet inspection. A lot of this stuff that we have to do around zero trust creates a lot of overhead. And the biggest challenge with security professionals is not hindering business, making, you know, companies don't want to run slower and have slower systems in the name of security. So that we have to do this without slowing down the speed of business. And I think that's going to be the biggest challenge because a lot of the technology exists today, but it comes at a cost of, of efficiency. So my hope is that over time that goes away, the technology gets better, things get faster. Um, but as Jesse asked about the deep packet inspection, when you have to look at every little one and zero that goes across a network wire, that takes a lot of overhead and that slows things down. So if you're, you know, if you're used to like gig speed internet, when you start putting this stuff in, you're not getting gig speed anymore. It might be like right. 300 megs, right? And that, that might annoy people if they're used to that fast, you know, gig speed internet. So that's the balance that we have to that we have to work with over the next few years is making sure that we can secure that we can implement things like zero trust without costing the business much in efficiency. Well, and that's that's the thing. Not only when you create overhead, but overhead means money. And so I'll throw this out there. Whoever wants to answer it is budget still a hurdle for you to get clients to implement even basic solutions uh, on that front, on the uh, security front. It's and go ahead, hurdle. Randy. Yeah. yeah, it's a huge hurdle. Um, you know, businesses need to start getting in their, or their mind to spend around 3% of annual revenue just for cybersecurity. Um, and that's a big chunk. Um, that's on top of your IT. Um, it is, it's, it's a lot to swallow, if you will. And, but they need to start thinking about it because they need to start um, protecting themselves. And um, everything that Brian said is right on where we, we do a lot in the construction trades, um, you know, electrical construction, drywall, and a lot of those people that, that, are, that are in those trades, they don't like, fire, like the technology. Um, and you know what really helps is getting buy-in um, from the owner. Um, if the owner has the buy-in and just say, "Come on, y'all, suck it up. Um, we need to take this next step." Um, and then you know, <laughs> at the end at the end of the day, um, a big important part of security it's got to stay out of the way of business. Business comes first. Business pays the way, pays the bills. Um, so yeah, it's this constant trade-off. Um, and every I just want to chime in everything Brian said, I, I would totally agree with that. Well, and that brings up a point. Um, I forget who mentioned it at the beginning of the webinar, but uh, employee training. I think there, there still is a dearth of making employees aware of what is out there and how they can spot it. So again, open to whoever wants to chime in and I'd like to hear from, from all of you. What are you doing? Where do you see employee training in terms of what is effective and what are your clients telling you in terms of implementing that training for their employees? So, yeah, I'll, I'll just, I'll just ahead, get it off. I, I, cause I have a very strong opinion on this cause I've looked at it a lot of different ways. Um, and if you really wanna develop a culture of cybersecurity in your business, you're gonna have to deliver this in a way, A, it's engaging, um, B, that is frequent. It is not a thing that you bring everybody in a conference room and do it once a quarter, or you talk about it once a year. So you check the box on the cyber insurance application that says you do it. Um, really delivering short, maybe five minute videos. We have platforms that are available through our companies that do this, 
Um, they're very engaging. They're, they're I want to say they're cartoonish, but they're kind of in a format of a cartoon. It's not like you're going to watch some talking head on the screen, just, you know, talking technical jargon. It's very engaging. It shows you, you know, different scenarios that can happen in your day, not at a high level. This is what, how, but this is what this email is going to look like when you get right. it, and it and it could be a fish. Um, doing that once a week, um, it, it, um, in my opinion, is the best way to go. That's going to start creating things like water cooler talk in the office. Like, hey, did you see that training video? And we get this feedback from our clients when we roll this type of stuff out. Hey, did you see that training video? Oh yeah, we all got that one email and that was totally fake. You know that? And that's the stuff that you want to start hearing in the office to know that your company is actually buying in and becoming aware and becoming part of the team that protects your data. Well, and Andre, this goes back to your point about culture. Mm -hmm. So from the training perspective, do you have any sort of specific recommendations for the business folks who are watching this or may watch this uh, subsequently as it relates to implementing what Brian just said on that consistent training uh, schedule? Yeah, so the first thing that we do is whenever it's a new employee onboarding, we are part of that onboarding process. So when the new, the new users, or let's just say the new employees is starting, we spend five, 10 minutes introducing ourselves, letting them know how to get support from us. If you have an email um, and you think it's suspicious, it's okay. Your client, you, the, the company is paying us a flat fee. You can email us as much times as you want. We have no problem um, analyzing it for you, letting you know if it's good, bad, what to look for. Um, we implement the password manager from the beginning so that they don't start to get the habit of trying to save their passwords in Chrome and Edge and all of those uh, things. Mm -hmm. And um, and then just, so we try to do it from the beginning because as we all know, you know, sometimes you can't uh, uh, teach people uh, that are stuck in their, uh, well, not say stuck, but are in their ways. So by getting- They're stuck. <laughs> yeah, all right, trying to be nice. Yeah, so if we can get them, if we can get that employee from the beginning to have that culture and to know that we're in this together, then it's just gonna be so much easier. They're gonna be our advocate. We even have some of our companies where it, uh, call them team leads. So they don't even send the email to support. They can just go, hey, Jeff, can you take a look at this for me? And then, uh, hey, look, yep, this email, is, it's a phishing because of look at this and, and things like that. So develop that culture from the beginning and it's gonna go a long way. Okay, Randy, you get to close this out on this one. Um, I would definitely say, uh, repeat what I said earlier, is to get the owner, the owner buy-in. Um, if you can get owner buy-in or leadership buy-in of the department, the company, get buy-in to that, that what you're doing is important as far as that training goes. Um, that will go a long way towards creating that culture because you really do have to create that culture. You've got to create the culture that our livelihood you know, both a business owner and, and employees also like their very job could be lost um, because of someone on the team accidentally making a mistake or whatever that re that involves cyber crime. And so you create that culture of, hey, this is something we need to know about. And it's so it is it's very rewarding what Andre mentioned when they send you an email. Um, hey, does this does this look suspicious to y'all? You know, we've had that happen twice this week where um, in one case, it was actually the fish test email that we sent and one of the employees forwarded mm -hmm. it over to us and they're like, Hey, this looks really suspicious. You know, what do I do? Um, and then another one turns out it wasn't, it wasn't suspicious at all. They just weren't expecting it. Um, but bottom, bottom line, um, developing that culture starts at the top and you get the buy-in from that. And if you can make it something exciting, um, we actually, I did a presentation with a company recently it, with the employees and the owner had to leave because he had a, an emergency. Um, it's a construction company and the employees, it was a groundswell. They're like, they're like, boss, we have to do all this. So sometimes maybe it pushes up, but normally it starts at the top and works, it works its way down. I got to say with your scenario there, I'm more proud of the person who sent the non phishing email to question it yes. than the phishing email. Yes. Uh, because yeah. then that means their radar is at a much higher level. Uh -huh. uh, in terms of trying to be aware, the spidey senses right. are tingling. Yeah, yeah, a good. Uh, and Randy brings up a good point there in his in his in his talk is that I believe no training and awareness program 
is good unless it's coupled with testing the employee. So oh yeah. He mentioned that Absolutely. they tested it, right? So we, we call it fake phishing, right? We, we fake fish the employees to see if they're clicking on things and see if they're giving us their, uh, their email password. We'll send them like a Microsoft <laughs> Outlook Office 365. Sure. You need to reset your password. And then they go to a fake site that we set up. And if they dump their credentials, we record that. And then we give a report to the customer every month saying, here's all the people that fell for our right. fake fish this month. Um, so you have to inspect what you expect is what I always say in my business. Like you got to make sure that if you're, that training's working, you better be fake fishing them and testing right. them to make sure. Cause if you don't want that test to be a cyber criminal, right? So, well, yeah. and to Jesse's point in the chat, he says, create a no blame culture. I, I agree with that to a point. I think no public blame culture, but you do have to call offenders on the carpet because they have to know you're not paying attention because you, again, their livelihood, your livelihood could be at stake because really, let's be honest, small mid-sized businesses that get hit by cyber incidents are less likely to recover because they just don't have the financial wherewithal versus a fortune 500 or 1000 company that gets hit. Yeah. I don't, I think the biggest thing that I, I think the biggest thing that most business owners are surprised with when I meet with them and talk to them about like their situation is that I, I tell people all the time and they're like, no way. If you get hit with a cyber attack, you're buying all new computers. Yeah. You can't put yeah. those computers back right. into right. your network because you don't probably, you don't have the telemetry. You don't have the, the, the logs, the information where a cybersecurity expert could go, okay, here's when they got in. Here's when they did the damage. And then you can kind of maybe go back to a backup two weeks ago because you know they sure. got in. Most small businesses don't have that information. So you got to assume they've been in for six months or a year, right? And then that means you're either wiping the machines or you're buying all new ones. And either one is expensive. You're going to have to pay a professional yeah. to come in and do that. That's man hours or, or whatever. And a lot of small businesses think like, oh, we can just like get rid of the virus and, and move on and keep using our computers. And you know, you're probably looking at it at an average of five to six hours per computer in your business. So you do the math, right. you know, to get it back up and running, you know, after the event. And that's on the that's on the minimum side. Like it, you know, bigger companies, more complex companies, that number is just going to go up. Sure. And let's so it's just about ten of. We've got about five or six more more minutes. One area that uh, I didn't send you guys the prompt question on, but it, it I should have, is this, I call it an illusion that using cloud-based services either means you're not responsible or you're more secure than if you had it in-house, which is neither portion is true on there. So what are your thoughts on cloud-based solutions, let's say Google or Office 365, um, and how do you explain, or or how do you explain why this does not disabuse the company of their responsibilities to be secure? And we're going to make this a round robin because all of you have had experience with this. So Simply, whoever wants to go straight, first, yeah, straight straight up. I mean. When you sign up for these services, you sign this really long, whether you read it or not, <laughs> yeah. in, terms of in terms of service. Sure. And every single cloud provider that I'm aware of, unless they're providing like backup services or security service specifically, are are resolving them or absolving themselves from any of that stuff. They're not responsible right. for your data. They're not responsible for your security. And it's on you to figure out ways to back up your Gmail, your Office 365 email, or secure it. So, you know, you you literally sign them. So if you try to go back at them after an event, they're going to be like, hey, here's the terms of services. This is on you, not on us. Well, and the other thing is, and then, Andre, I'm going to move on to you, is their limitation of liability. Now, I'm not a lawyer, but I do talk to enough of them that I've, I've become familiar with these in that. Let's say you use Microsoft. If Microsoft is hacked, Microsoft is saying, well, we're only responsible for whatever the value of your monthly service is times two. Mm -hmm. So 
all of a sudden, all your data or all your systems have been hacked, but we're only responsible for a thousand dollars. Right. And and now all of a sudden you're facing a fine of five hundred thousand dollars, and Microsoft saying, "Well, the rest is on you." Um, so Andre, uh, on your side, um, how do you approach your clients when it comes to cloud? Yeah, definitely about the education because a lot of times people think, "Oh, it's Microsoft, it's Google. They can't get hacked. They're too big to get hacked." But they're actually one of the biggest targets because mm -hmm. they have so many users. So we do definitely um, explain that to them, which is why we also tell them our services that we do are not 100% guaranteed. We're put, we're adding layers of security, and which is you know kind of a, a shoe into what you do, Sean. Is which is why you also still need to get even with our services and all the stacks that we put in, you still need to then have a insurance policy because if something happens, you're going to need that, that coverage. And that's and, important. And to that end, even when I was in the industry, we told people all the time, this is not 100% and never will be 100% at any given point in time. So uh, you, you have to do things. That's why I say it's always prevent and recover. You, you have to have that plan. Okay, Randy, uh, let's close, close it out with yourself. Um, yeah, so this is something that obviously we hear all the time also. And just to add to what they said, um, because the very good points, uh, both by Brian and Andre, um, think about back in the day, every small office had a server and computers. And mm -hmm. all you're doing with SaaS, which is software as a service, all you're doing is moving the server to the cloud. And so you still have to protect the computers that and the devices and you need the, that. that the, so two thoughts, you have to protect them, the ones that access that server. And so just because you have 365 and even if you signed up for all the security services that they have, you still need to protect the device that accesses the server. Um, and people, people just don't they don't think about that. They think that, you know, well, hey, now that I'm in the cloud, um, you know, I don't have to worry about it. But to me, that's just life in 2022. And so we have to change our way of thinking. We still want to know, are people trying to log into those 365 services? Where are they trying to log in? I want to get a notification. Um, you know, if somebody coughs in their general direction from some foreign place, that's mm -hmm. not where they normally lock in. I want to right. get it, log in. I want to get a notification of that. Sure. We want to know. So yeah. So it does. All it does is just moves moves some pieces around, but it doesn't really change the game a whole lot. And now, so go ahead, Brian. I just real quick. That was a great point by Randy because we literally uh, we're just outside of Philly in South Jersey. We literally just took over a, a big chamber in South Jersey simply because their current MSP moved them to the cloud and completely neglected their office network and all the devices they used to connect to that server. And we came in and we evaluated that. And we said, all these computers are out of date and highly susceptible to a cyber attack right now. And they're yeah. like, oh, well, our, our, our provider told us we don't have to worry about this stuff because we're in the cloud. So there's <laughs> actual like IT professionals out there right. telling advice what Randy just said. And it's, it's, it's not true. Like you have to protect right. everything. So, well, as we were talking about before we hit record, I have a client who had a, a ransomware attack uh, last year in 2021, but it's because the IT company, their outsourced IT company screwed up, did something that they patently knew they shouldn't do and did it anyway. Um, and that, that annoyed me to no end because it just shouldn't have happened. Um, but again, even it's the cobbler's kids. Sometimes you hire somebody who has an MSP, but they're human and maybe they, they have the same biases that some other people do about, okay, move you to the cloud, you'll be fine type of deal. And it's not the case. Uh, you have to be worried about every device that connects to the internet. Uh, and that's just the reality of, of the situation. So um, we are at our end point. Uh, I want to close it out with one more point to sort of wrap up something that we just talked about in terms of cloud. Microsoft offers Office 365, which is their cloud-based platform. Microsoft just partnered with a company called At Bay that offers cyber insurance. And basically they, told, they, they tell 
users of Office 365, if you implement all the security features that are available to you through Office 365, you can get a discount on the app Bay cyber insurance uh, program, which again, this is carrot stick method. We want you to be as secure as possible, uh, but we still understand even as Microsoft, something might happen. So you need to have that recovery piece and the insurance is that recovery piece. So um, again, to Randy's point, this is just the nature of doing business in 2022, which yet some days I'm willing to go back to pen and paper. If anybody wants to join me, I'm, I'm good with pen and paper. We can send letters via the mail. I'm sure the U.S. Postal Service would love that again, um, but that's not going to happen. So, hey, gentlemen, thank you very much. This was great. Uh, I have to give you compliments. I've really enjoyed listening to your, your podcast. Uh, it is now a weekly listen for me. And uh, again, as I, I confess, I've actually stolen some of your lines to use with prospects and clients. So uh, I suggest everybody who's interested in cybersecurity, go to your uh, favorite podcast platform, look up Security Squawk. You get some really good information. In fact, your episode about the employees, about the rogue employees is a really good one that people should listen to because yeah. to the point that we brought up, that's becoming more common and uh, could potentially be devastating for companies uh, okay. on that fact. So I encourage everybody to give a listen. So and I we, want to uh, thank we uh, Go ahead. we also have uh, real quick. We also have a, a really uh, one that we did on a deep dive on multi-factor authentication. So yes. if you're yep. behind the eight ball on that one. Go check out that podcast because we reviewed like four or five guys and in, in yes. detail of, of the features and benefits of all of them. So. And, and they don't, you didn't do it in a way that you have to be in technology to understand it. You can listen to that and you can actually get some good guidance to where you can talk to whoever does your IT with some knowledge and understand what they talk back to you. But if you don't understand your IT folks and they won't clarify for you, move on to somebody who will because that's the whole point of uh, Brian, Randy, and Andre, is that they're going to make you understand what they're trying to accomplish, and they're not there to bamboozle you with tech speak. Uh, anybody who does that, they're not your friend. Uh, so make sure that you understand what your IT provider is doing, uh, and from a selfish standpoint, get cyber insurance, because you really don't want to pay for this stuff out of pocket when it does happen. Uh, so that's I don't it. think you can. I don't think you can pay for it out of pocket. Yeah, most small <laughs> mid-sized no. businesses can't anymore. Yeah, the numbers right. are just getting too big. So yep. that's it, folks. Thank you very much. Again, my name is Sean O'Rourke, and you've been watching uh, The Changing Landscape of Cyber Threats put on by the Queen's Chamber of Commerce Tech Committee. I want to thank everybody. I want to thank Brian, Randy, and Andre. This was fantastic. Uh, we might do this again in a different format at a different point because I think um, uh, I never tire of talking about it. And even though Andre's right, people get tired of hearing it. I think we continue to bludgeon them over the head until everybody buys in uh, is a necessary evil. But if you uh, if you have any questions, uh, obviously in the invite you had everybody's information, feel free to reach out to them. They'll be more than happy to, uh, to give you some guidance or insights on your questions. And until next time, everybody take care and thank you. Thank you. Thank you everyone. Thanks thank everybody. You.